Hello and welcome to A Time to Reconcile. I'm Pastor Tom Pickett. Thank you for joining with us today. My wife and I are recording this sermon message in our living room and we want to share it with you today. The title of today's sermon is The Ascension of Jesus, What Does It Mean? Because uh, this Sunday is Ascension Sunday and it means this. Jesus had been received by his Father after the resurrection. That was before Mary could touch him. Jesus said, I haven't been received by my Father. He wanted to be received by his Father to share the good news that he had successfully fulfilled his Father's will to save all humanity and not to condemn humanity. And he had reconciled all of us to be our Father's holy children. Now that is really good news. So now we come to 40 days after the resurrection and he's going to be going back to his father once again. But before we get there, let's go to 2 Corinthians 5 and before we do that, let us have prayer to begin our service today. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us, sending your son Jesus to us. Thank you that he went to you after his resurrection from the dead and he confirmed that what he had been sent to do, he had done. It had been finished. And so now he is going back to you again on Ascension Sunday. And he is saying, Father, thank you for receiving me again now to for us to send the Holy Spirit on Pentecost 10 days from now. So we thank you, dear God, that we can look at that and see the wonderful meaning that Ascension uh, by Jesus uh, 40 days after the resurrection has for us today in receiving the Holy Spirit. And we do ask and pray your inspiration and thank you in Jesus' most holy name. And all together we say, Amen. Well, let us uh, begin this sermon message with uh, going to 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14 because this is kind of like a recap of what we're talking about here with Jesus. And uh, it's all good news. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. For Christ's love compels us, just like the Father sent Jesus in His love. So Jesus' love for us compels us as believers in Him because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died, and He died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for Him who died for them and was raised again. So. That's talking about our receiving the Holy Spirit, His Spirit life, in other words. And so we go into verse 16. So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. And that should be uh, the fruit of a Christian mind. We don't look at it through carnal eyes anymore. We look at it through the eyes of Jesus. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, in verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. See, that new spiritual creation that we become when the Holy Spirit indwells our hearts. Because then, Jesus and the Father live in our hearts as well. The old is gone, the new is here. As soon as we believe that is the case, all this is from God. In other words, it was God's desire. and He sent Jesus to us, our Heavenly Father did. It's all from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So you see that Jesus was sent to restore the relationship we had with our Father in the garden before sin. And now after sin has been forgiven, the resurrection of the dead has happened, and we've been given the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, then we are all reconciled to our Heavenly Father. And then our Father says to us, His children, I want you to go and be a part of my Son Jesus' ministry of reconciliation today. And this means, the ministry of reconciliation means in verse 19, that God was reconciling the world to Himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. That's what it means. So Jesus has already done this, and he's the only one who can reconcile us, and he has done that with our Father. So he wants now us to join with him too, as the Father's commissioned us to do. So he has 
Jesus has committed to us then the message of reconciliation. So each believer then is committed in Jesus' view to participate in the ministry of reconciliation. In verse 20, we are therefore Christ ambassadors representing his kingdom of light today as though God were making his appeal through us. And he is, and he's wanting us to speak it then, uh, to speak what the ministry of reconciliation is in the verses in 2 Corinthians 5. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We need to do that. We need to say that to everybody we have the opportunity to say it to. That's what we need now in these turbulent times, murderous times. We just had uh, 19 school children and two teachers slaughtered in Uvalde, Texas. And that is because this is Satan's world. But God is coming back in Jesus to bring us to himself in heaven and then he's going to return with us to make the new heavens and new earth where we live today. But Jesus has already conquered Satan, but Satan still rules this world for the time being. And his time is short. So what we need to be saying to people today, be reconciled to God. There's no other reconciliation available to us. And we don't need any other reconciliation. For God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. See, in being the holy children of God. That is one of the main things that happened when Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to us. So, ten days before Pentecost, Jesus ascended to his Father so that he could send the Holy Spirit. Let's notice Jesus promised he would do that so that we would not be orphans. Let's go to John, the 14th chapter. The Gospel of John, verse 14. And Jesus here promises the Holy Spirit. John 14 and verse 15. If you love me, keep my commands. And that's the commands of love. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, in other words, someone to stand up for us, to help you and be with you forever, the Holy Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and, and will be in you. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit would be in the disciples, and uh, the others who believed in Jesus at that time. So when the Holy Spirit came, it, it got everybody's attention, and many uh, believed in Jesus from that time forward. I will not leave you as orphans. See, it's about a relationship with God. Uh, and when we become the children of God, of course, then we're not orphans anymore. I will come to you and before long the world will not see me anymore but you will see me see because I live and he did for 40 days with him after the resurrection you also will live on that day you will realize that I am in my father this is the part of the relationship that we have and you are in me and I am in you whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me because the commands are about God's love and our loving others as Jesus has loved us. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them, and he does. He does that today. And the more we show our love to others, the more we show our love to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the more we see his love, the more we feel his love, the more we understand about his love in our lives and the lives of all his creation. So let's go to Acts, the uh, first chapter now. Acts 1 and verse 1. Acts 1 and verse 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven 
after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. See, he had to, he had to convince them he was actually alive. Now, he looked alive, and he acted alive, and he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? So they, they didn't talk about what he was talking about. They went back to the Old Testament prophets trying to figure out a, a way of connecting all the dots. <laughs> well, they, they had them all connected with Jesus. They just needed to focus on him. We always have a problem just connecting ourselves with Jesus. He's the answer to everything. And so eventually they'll come to realize that. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has said by his own authority, but you will receive power with the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And that's what we're supposed to be doing again today as ministers of Christ's reconciliation. Verse 9, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them, and they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And so this is what we know. He's going to be coming back the same way as he went into heaven ten days before Pentecost. So, uh, let's go back to John 20 before we go to 1 Thessalonians. Because when Jesus revealed himself to his disciples, Thomas doubted. He said, I won't believe unless I can touch him and put my hand in his side and my fingers in his wounds and his uh, wrist and so the second Sunday Jesus presented himself to them Thomas was there and in verse 24 we see that now Thomas also known as Didymus one of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came so the other disciples told him we have seen the Lord but he said to them unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And a week later his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. And though the door were locked, doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. He realized he was truly God at that moment in time. And Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. So we need to stop doubting and believe, like Jesus told Thomas. Let's go down to 1 Thessalonians because this this passage of scripture tells us how the return of Jesus will look and feel for us. It will certainly be wonderful news when it happens. And we see that that day is not that far off. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 13. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Him. Like the 19 children who were killed in Uvalde and the two teachers who were killed in Uvalde this past week, they are waiting for this return to Jesus because they will be coming down with Him 
to greet those who were still alive. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we who are still alive and are left with left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Hallelujah! Can you just sense that? That exciting time that we know that we're going to be with the Lord forever. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And we do need to encourage each other with these words because we live in perilous times, dangerous times, horrible times, because of what Satan does to us. He inspires people to kill and murder and cause mayhem. And we need to realize we have a commission to do too, and that's to preach the ministry of reconciliation in Christ. He's our only answer, he's our only hope, and he's going to return in glory. And we can all be looking forward to that, but we've got a, a commission by our Father to do before he comes. So let's now, now go to Acts 2, where the giving of the Holy Spirit came, and um, Pentecost had done its good work. The Holy Spirit was sent by Jesus to us, and we were blessed. Beyond understanding, we were blessed. So, Acts 2 and verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them, and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. It was a miraculous time, and there was no doubt that something very special had happened. So Peter addresses the crowd in verse 14. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd, Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. So in Joel 2, and that'll be verses 28 through 32, it is listed here, beginning in verse 17 of Acts 2. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We have a rich harvest out there that we all, as the body of Christ, need to be bringing in for Jesus. Verse 22, Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Amen. And he was resurrected from the dead for us and, of course, himself, but for us so that we can have spirit life like he has spirit life through the Holy Spirit. Now let's go to John the 17th chapter and verse 20. This is another thing that happened because he ascended to the right hand of the Father and sent us the Holy Spirit. He answers his prayer that he prayed to his Father in John 17 verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one Father just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us 
see, in the Spirit, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you have given to me, that they may be one as we are one. I and them, and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. And this is something that is still happening today, and needs to happen today. Then the world will know that you sent me, and have loved them even as you have loved me. Profound. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am, and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. And Jesus lives us in us through the indwelling Holy Spirit today. Ephesians 2 verse 4 gives us another understanding of where we are with Jesus because we've received the Holy Spirit in our lives. Ephesians 2 beginning in verse 4. But because of his great love for us God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions it is by grace you have been saved. So us receiving the Holy Spirit brought us into this relationship with Jesus and it says, says in verse 6 and then God raised us up with Christ in the Spirit and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus and that's where we are today we're there and we're here on the earth in order see the reason for that is in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus now, if we don't realize this is what the ascension of Christ means for us today, well, we're missing a tremendous aspect of the relationship we have in Christ. We, we just don't understand how complete that relationship is. In the Spirit, we're one with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they live in us as well. And then we're at the right hand of Jesus right now, this moment. It's amazing, isn't it? In verse 8, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. We're not supposed to be boasting. We're supposed to be witnessing and sharing the good news of the gospel. And including in that gospel the fact that we've been reconciled by Jesus to our Heavenly Father, as you've been able to see in the scriptures today. So this fulfillment reconciles us to our Father, and it makes us the ministers of Christ's reconciliation today. Let's notice that over in Colossians, the first chapter. Colossians, the first chapter, in verse 21. Colossians 1 and verse 21. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. That was us one time. That's everybody, one time or the other. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body. And that's important because as we saw with Thomas, Jesus showed him that he had a physical body. Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. He identifies with us even in heaven today. He's got a glorious body, but he has a physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Now, the devil wants to accuse us, but Jesus blocks that today if we believe in him. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. And hopefully we can put our name in there too, that we have become a servant of God for the same reasons. Let us now go to the concluding scripture over in 1 John, 1 John 3. John's epistle, 1 John. 1 John 3, verses 1 and 3. 
See what great love the Father has lavished on us. Have you noticed that today? That we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. And the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made completely known. We look through a glass darkly. But we know this, that when Christ appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. We, who will be raised from the dead, will have a body that's glorified. He'll come down to us with a body that's glorified. And we will see Him as He is, face to face. All who have this hope in Him purify themselves just as He is pure because we want to become more like Him more and more every day. It's such a wonderful love that God has given to us in Christ. It's amazing. And it just gets deeper and broader and wider and more inclusive in everything that He's done and is doing for us today. So as it says in verse 2, But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Please join with me in prayer as we close. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank You so much in the precious and only name of Jesus for sending Jesus to us so that He could die for us, be raised from the dead, send the Holy Spirit to us, and give us that relationship with You and to be Your children, Father, for eternity. But now You've commissioned us as Your children to go to Your Son, Jesus, and be His ministers of His reconciliation on the earth today to represent the kingdom of light, representing the kingdom that's going to come. We ask and pray that you help us to represent Jesus by loving others as He has loved us. And we thank you, dear God, for this opportunity. We ask and pray that you'll bless us during this memorial weekend to remember those who've sacrificed their lives for us so we can have liberty. But thank you mainly to Jesus who's given us liberty through death being conquered and sin being forgiven for us. We thank you and ask your blessings to be with us and your protection, protecting us from Satan and his demons and the ways of his world. It's in the precious and holy name of Jesus that we pray and all together we say, Amen.